Winston Churchill once said, The truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. And while being assured that his statement is an irrefutable definitive, after recording this very episode, I was left with a hole. A hole where the answer to a specific question would seem to fit nicely. That question? What if there is no truth? Not in the sense that what's being spoken about is a lie, but that the truth just seems to be absolutely absent. There's just no truth available. Every other marker is there to be judged, but the pure truth of the thing isn't just conspicuously absent. It seems to have never existed to begin with. In such a circumstance, my only recourse seems to revert to a childlike wonderment. A completely sincere expression of awe that true unsolvable mystery can, and in fact, does make itself known. If you're willing to brave the exhausting disappointment of possibly never knowing the answer. That's because the answer as it stands, being the end to the figuring out of an equation, seems so astronomically out of reach, the only retort I see as appropriate is to wonder at the marvel. Let its awe inspire you to ask questions of the solvable queries that confront you every single day. Use that feeling to kick a little ass every now and then. Chris. Here we are. Here Yet we again. are. Finally. Yet again. You and me. My wonderful friends. We shall see about that. We're here again to you tell some cookie. creeps about something that's weird. About something for freaks. You know. The usual. Here on this wonderfully musical episode of See, No, Hear, No, Speak, No. (laughs) The UFOs, the conspiracies, and the murder. Indeed, sir. So, how how was your day? I know you've been having a, a nice, busy, you know, truck driving... Uh, you know, east, mountain down, load them up and trucking. We're going to do <laughs> what they say can't be done kind of day. Well, that is not legal anymore. But, um, yeah, it's been an okay day. Can't complain. Indeed. Indeed, indeed. I like that. Can't I like complain. when you can't complain. You always still do. But I like when you say that you can't. I mean, if I had a complaint, I would just... You know, take it straight up the backside of Uncle Mike's head. Ah, that's right. I was about Where to say. Where it belongs. If you had a complaint, <laughs> it would be about Uncle Mike's. Uh, <laughs> the only thing you take from the backside is Ronnie Peters. Dude. <laughs> you nasty. You tell no, Mike he, that if he wants to talk during the show, he's got to be mic'd up. He always has to bring it straight to the penis. That's right. So nasty. And that's what you call nope. being mic'd up. Yeah, Jason said you got to be mic'd up if you want to comment, chicken fucker. Anyway. He added the chicken fucker part. I didn't say that. So, today is the lucky, lucky, lucky day of me, because it's my episode. Right. And I'm soups excited about soup. And in this episode... I won't be mentioning it at all. But I'm also excited about this episode. Soup? Soup. What, yeah. What kind of soup? Um, you know, I my favorite soup is, uh, hands down, it is uh, a broccoli cheese soup. Which, Yummy. Which really is, is just like, uh, it's just like broccoli with nacho cheese. So I don't know mm. how you can say that's a soup, but it's a soup. So that's my fave. What about you? 
What's your pick? Yeah, yeah. Anything with broccoli. Love potato soups. Love chowders like corn chowders. And yeah, I'm I'm down with a good corn chowder. My problem with potato soups though is that uh, sometimes the the chunks of potato are just so like uh, dry compared to the rest of the soup. Yeah, it depends on what kind of potato you use. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, but it's I don't know. It just seems that sometimes. Well, I I've had bad experience, I guess, with potato soups as a whole, and usually that's mm. because. It's I, their, you know, canned soup that I make at home. Like, I bet if I got a good potato soup from a real good restaurant, my tune would probably change a little bit. Yeah, 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 probably. I guess if you, maybe if you made one yourself, too. Yeah. I've, from a good I, recipe. You know, I, I don't, I'm sure that, because I can follow recipes. I can follow instructions on things, and, and things I make that way usually come out really well. For some reason, it seems like, it just to me like a soup would be out of my ballpark. Mm-hmm. It's just so not. I've never made a soup from scratch before. Cream, especially cream-based soups, uh, they can be they can be a little touchy for the amateur. It, indeed, because you, you, like especially a cream-based one, because you have to be sure not to to burn the cream, because then it. it's mm-hmm. just gross. It's just gross. Mm-hmm. So, uh. That's a great segue, uh, in no way, to what we will be speaking about today. Which, oh, I love seafood bisques, by the way, as well. You know what? Fucking uh, crab bisque, crab and <sighs> or like a uh, crawfish, crawfish. Uh, uh. bisque is probably, I, I would have to say that that kicks the shit out of broccoli and cheese, actually. Like <laughs> Doesn't good, it, though? <laughs> like a good bisque is just so fucking good. A properly made French bisque is, is mm. un- ugh, so good. Like I don't even, I wouldn't even say that's soup. That's just that it's in its own. Uh, it's in, it's that's its own game. It's in its own it's league. Velvety it's velvety liquid heaven. God, it's so good. It's salty, but it's got that little tinge of like sweet, like coconut milk flavor in it. And mm. man, <coughs> you know why? Why? It's from the heads. It's from the head? Oh, yeah. Elaborate. Uh, well, bisque is made from from boiling down the heads and the, you know, the, the bodies of whatever, the crustacean oh, or whatever you're using. gotcha, gotcha. So, so you have all the, the fat and the, uh, the, the proteins and stuff that were in the heads mm-hmm. that are now, like, the base of the soup. I, I, it makes sense. It absolutely makes sense, and I dig it. I dig it, and I really want some bisque now. Yeah. Um, well, you so, can have bisque or gumbo if you want it. I gotta, <laughs> gotta make it myself. Well, I mean, I could if I wanted, but that would still involve me going out to a place that has it to find it, to get it, to buy it, to eat it, and that's just way more steps than I'm even capable of now. The internet and Uber Eats, they won't uh, bring it to me though. Yeah, you have Wisconsin. to have Wisconsin. You have to have a credit card for that and stuff, and I'm not putting my name on paper for the man to see, That's man. That's how they get you. That's how they get you. It's when you get Uber Eats. That's when they come <laughs> after you. So, today's episode is more of a mystery than anything else. Um, ooh. Yeah, yeah, ooh. You got that goddamn right. But I figured we would take somewhat of a small bit of a break from the people hurting to... Let's go into more of a, uh, ouch, my brain hurts a little bit because, uh, this is confusing and mysterious. Jason's a weirdo. I dig it. Let's, let's, mm-hmm. let's fucking run this shit. So, today we will be, we will be talking about <clears throat> the Voynich Manuscript. Nice. So you are familiar then, sir? I am. I am indeed. I would love to hear the the facts or whatever again because you know it's always fun, but uh, yes, I, I'm definitely familiar. So, so the Voynich manuscript itself is uh, an illustrated codex, uh, which a a, a codex uh, comes from the the, the Latin word uh, codex, which is the trunk of a tree or a block of wood, uh, but mostly mostly just means a book, 
that has um, a, a similar a, a theme somewhat throughout. Um, okay. Now, As most uh, books do. Indeed. Uh, well, I mean, I mean yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, the Voynich manuscript is, uh, is particularly interesting, though, because it has been carbon dated to the early 15th century, which uh, it, more specifically somewhere between 1404 to 1438. Mm. Um, and that is is kind of all we know about it for sure as far as where it comes from because the manuscript itself uh, was written in a complete code which to this day has not been solved or deciphered that's crazy talk from uh, the early 1400s to 2019, we still don't know what this book says. They can figure out Sanskrit and mm-hmm. cuneiform and all this other shit and can't figure out what the hell this book is talking about. That's crazy Well, there's, there's, there's a couple really neat reasons for that that we'll get uh, you know pretty in-depth with, but uh, I think... One of the the more uh, intriguing to me is the fact that the the script, the writing in this book, has no corrections or mistakes in it. Which one of the big points that a lot of uh, you know uh, these these smart eggheady brainy people make is that usually when somebody's writing uh, a coded work, it has a lot of uh, you know breaks or uh, it, every single line in this book was written in one line, like a, a straight writing it out like you were just writing in script. It's mm-hmm. it's as if this person were not looking at uh, some sort of cipher, which even some of the best code breakers in the world or code makers in the world still need to do, which means a a flowing uh, you know, script is almost impossible. And for some reason, that's always really stood out to me, is that whoever wrote this thing wrote it in uh, a very intentional, clean uh, manner, which Hmm. is hard to do when you think of what you need to write, and then you have to sit there and uh, code it with some sort of of cipher sheet. So uh, this book, of course has since been studied by uh, a bunch of professional and, of course, amateur cryptographers. Uh, these include American and British code breakers from both World War One and II. Um, but absolutely no one knows what it says. Now, there, there's, there's more to this. <clears throat> there's more to this book than just the fact that it's written in code. And we will get into these things now you ready yay so we'll start off this whole code thing you know as a yeah as a kid and and all that i don't know if it was just my love for james bond which i still have um or you know any of that kind of stuff like spy games and and the secret codes and all that kind of shit was really intriguing to me as a kid and we all like we me and a couple other kids taught ourselves to to read and write the Greek alphabet just to just for fucking around sake in class and very cool <laughs> passing notes it's super simple but, yeah um, like I I when I was a kid I as well not with the Greek alphabet but uh, my my brother and I uh, we taught ourselves uh, a a dumbed down version of Morse code so that we could uh, we had these you know little kid walkie talkies or whatever that mm-hmm. we could you know say simple things to each other without actually saying something to each other and uh you know i always thought it was it was a really cool thing it's 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 like knowing a secret that only other people that are interested in knowing the secret will know because yeah. if if you don't give a shit about morse code or about the greek alphabet then uh you won't know but if you're cool like we were <laughs> exactly well, then these things would have interested you, and maybe you'd have checked them out, and then 
since you had because you were cool like us, <laughs> then you would be in on the game. That's right. But no, you were not invited. No, no, I was very rarely invited to things that uh, my mom didn't make my brother bring me to. Hmm. Mm, <clears throat> smelly yep. kids. I was one of those kids. Nope, I, it's not that I was smelly. I mean, I was, but that's not it. It's the <laughs> it's the whole thing that I was just uh, as insufferable as I am today. Oh. oh so let's oh. let's let's uh, touch on real quick about uh, the uh, the codicology of this book, which also means codicology. Uh, it just means the physical characteristics of a book. It's just that's a real word, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, C o d i c o l o g y codicology. Huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, it uh, measured about 23.5 by 16.2 centimeters. It's a which, decent sized book, man. Yeah, which uh, it inch wise is uh, 9.3 by 6.4 by 2.0. It has. Okay. Uh, well, so then it's maybe a little bigger than a DVD case. Yeah, yeah. L a li little bigger, a lot thicker. Um, it's not. Yeah. It's but not it's not like a, one of those huge, like, uh, dictionaries or some shit like that that you see, you know? Uh, but yeah, although, but when you see the, the fucking documentary on it, it, may, it does make it look like it seems, the way they film it or whatever, it seems bigger. Not yeah. quite Codex Gigas bigger, but... Right. Well, I mean, not, nine, by, 9 by 6 isn't, you know, that's nothing to scoff at, you know? And then the, the 6 by 4, you know, it's, uh, it, it's a, a decent-sized little manuscript. Um... It's not it, the size of the manuscript it, that counts. That's right. It, it's the coded messages and completely made up plants and animals within. Um, that's right. The book uh, uh, consisted of hundreds of vellum pages uh, collected into 18 uh, uh, queries. Now, vellum is a specific type of, uh, of paper, um, which is uh, it's an animal skin or membrane that you wrote on. Uh, Derived from the Latin word uh, vitulini wait, vitulinum, vit, vit, ugh, vitulium, whatever, uh, which which just meant made from calf. So uh, their ca it's a calfskin parchment is what the actual pages of this book were made from, um, well, then. and it has like I said hundreds of pages. The total number of pages is around two hundred and forty. But the the exact number depends on how many of the manuscripts' unusual foldouts, how they're counted, because they have mm -hmm. quite a few pages that then fold out into these upwards of I think uh, nine panel, uh, you know, kind of a pull out poster of sorts. Yeah, that would show certain uh, illustrations and things like that. Um, so the the queries have been numbered from one to twenty in various locations with uh, numerals consistent with the 1400s. And the top right-hand corner of each uh, recto, which is uh, right-hand page, has been numbered from 1 to 116 using numerals of a later date. So, <laughs> so bunch of pages, bunch of queries within. It's, it starts off kind of neat. But now we go to the, uh, the parchment covers and binding. So the radiocarbon dating uh, of the samples shows uh, this was performed at uh, the University of Arizona because that's a super important part of the story. It's not. I'm lying. No one cares about <laughs> you, UOA. Um, they, it, they were all consistently dated at, like I said, from around 1404 to 1438. So that is as close as they can get because there is no record of this book before a certain date, but the earliest written record of this book that isn't the book itself is from upwards of a hundred years after it was definitely, you know, written, which is also kind of fucking crazy. Hmm. So no one mentioned it in historical records of any kind until a hundred years after we know for a fact it was produced. Correct. Correct. And so absolutely it, no word of it before then, or the author, or anything exactly. like that. Exactly. Exactly. Huh. Um, the uh, the goatskin binding and covers 
weren't original to the book itself, uh, but date to its possession by the uh, uh, Collegio Romano, uh, which is where it was held for a long time. <clears throat> uh, and we see that uh, insect holes are present on the first and last of the folios, which suggests that a, uh, like a wooden cover was used at, at some point before the, the leather covers later because they would have had uh, little bugs living in and around it or whatever. And there's some discoloring on the edges of certain uh, points of these first and last pages. And that kind of says that it was also like it was in a tanned leather hide and then had a wooden uh, cover over it. But it was then then later uh, just had an actual lamb skin or goat skin uh, binding used. Fucking so now, book detectives over here. Indeed. Now we're going to get into the ink that was used. So, in the ink, many of the pages have these crazy drawings in them. Like, substantial amounts of drawings. A lot of them are based on, uh, well, our analysis of them. They used polarized light microscopy, which... Microscopy? They, Yes, microscopy. <laughs> My, <laughs> microscopy. I don't. It's, the more I say it, the, the worse it sounds to me. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds like mm. some fucking smelly Italian guy. I like microscopy. Microscopy. Or, or microscopy. That could work. Microscopy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they they determined that a quill pen and and iron gall ink were used for the the text and the figure outlines. Now there are these brightly colored pictures inside the book. But it was determined that the 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 coloring of these illustrations was most likely done at a later date and by someone who was not very skilled in in what they were doing. They almost certainly weren't the the person that that did the book itself and and the illustrations and things. The, now, how uh, can we tell that? Are, are the are they like colored out of the lines and stuff? Or well, it's it's um, it it you can really see by I mean the 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 illustrations themselves. It's no fucking Rembrandt, but there is a rhyme and reason to the the design of it all, and mm-hmm. with the with the colorization of these things, uh, it's just, it just seems haphazardly done. It just, it's a, a very crude application of color to these, these, uh, I wouldn't say like laboriously made illustrations, but whoever did it took care in doing so. And then it seemed like the color was just kind of slapped in. But they also, uh, they also his... did. D- they he did gave do a slow Uncle Charlie, or, or yeah, exactly, slow cousin Charlie a shot, or or s- slow nephew Charlie got a yeah. shot because he stole the book and was like coloring. I love coloring, <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah, and then he got uh, uh, spanked to death by probably the church. I don't know. It's fourteen hundreds. Um, it was a different time, ladies and gentlemen. It was a different time. <laughs> uh, not much different nowadays, but yeah, <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> Hmm. So they they also did uh, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy in 2009 Ooh. to find out what the uh, what what the inks and and colors were made from, and they found out that <laughs> they were major amounts of iron, sulfur, potassium, calcium, and carbon, also with trace amounts of copper and occasionally zinc. Wow. They. It didn't show the presence of lead, which is important because uh, they identified potassium lead oxide, potassium hydrogen sulfate, and syngenite in one of the samples, which they're basically what it's saying is that they found a, a big difference between the ink used for the, the drawings and the ink used in the coloring. Which means that they weren't. Uh, it says here. It suggested a contempora- contemporaneous origin, 
which means not the, not from the same place. <laughs> right. So I could go further into exactly what kind of paints that they used and things like that, but I'm not going to because let's just marvel at the fact that we can find out hundreds of years later that the ink used to do the drawings is at all different and from a different time period than the inks used to fill them in with color. Because who took the time? And was it to, to, to beautify this fucking book? Or was it out of boredom? Or what did somebody's kid fucking grab it and do it? Or like Seriously. what and why? It, it's, it's just another layer of mystery to the onion that is the Voynich. So Mysteries they did find... By its power. They did find in uh, a few folios that there was retouching done. So it wasn't at the time of of the writing of it that the guy made a mistake, scratched something out, and, and went back and fixed anything. This is hundreds of years down the line. They figured out that at some point, someone somewhere saw uh, little bits of faint ink and decided to go over it with a, with a heavier ink. Hmm. Yeah, so th this, uh, it's it's in a bunch of folios, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. There are sections of, of you know, fixed, uh, or retouched ink, which leads me to think that, you know, this book was very important, and not just because of the, of the mystery behind it, but at the same time almost exclusively because of the mystery behind it do you know right. what i mean like it is this ancient book but if let, let's say that the book is a hoax let's say it was made as a joke is it as important as if it were an actual text that maybe was encoded out of uh, fear of reprisal for writing about such things or do you know what I mean is it is it as Good important question. if it's a knock knock joke as it would be if it were some kind of profound poem depends on the timing I guess I guess it all depends on in where you insert the fart sound I suppose mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I I I feel it though. Like there's there's a lot of um, it is just a book, but I mean it's like I said, its powers is only exceeded by its mystery. And its Absolutely, mystery is only exceeded by its power. It perfectly said, fucking perfectly said. So every page in the manuscript contains text. Almost all of it is in this unidentified language. There are a couple of, of passages here and there that will have uh, some writing in, in Latin. Uh, some have, or I, I think they found one area where uh, ancient German was used. But for 99.9% .9 of this manuscript, it is in this unidentified language. Weird. So then this is where it gets even kind of a little stranger. So this unknown script runs from left to right. Uh, most of the characters are composed of one or two simple pin strokes. Some people dispute, um, or some dispute exists as to whether certain characters are distinct. But about 20 to 25 characters account for virtually all of the words in this, in this whole text. So just like we have, what, 28 letters or whatever in our, our 26, alphabet. 26, homie. 26, whatever. Man, I wasn't going to go count through them. I was close enough. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so this this alphabet has uh, from from 20 to 25, uh, and that is about what an alphabet consists of. So this makes sense. The exceptions are a few dozen rarer characters that only occur once or twice each. There's also no obvious punctuation in the entire book. Weird. Much of the text is written in a single column in the body of a page with slightly ragged right margin and paragraph divisions and sometimes with stars in the left margin. 
other text occurs in charts or as labels with illustrations, uh, there are no indications of any errors or corrections made at any place in the entire document. That's crazy. For that to be <clears throat> handwritten, that's yes. insane. Uh, uh, quill and ink written with yeah. no corrections made. The ductus uh, flows smoothly, giving the impression that the symbols weren't enciphered at all. This is what I was saying earlier. There's no delay between the characters as would normally be expected while you write something in code. Which So as if just one long run-on sentence? No, it's not that it's just one long run-on sentence. It's that there's no stopping inside of a word to make sure the next letter that you're writing for to finish this word is the correct one. This dude just knew and ri- and wrote it out. So kind of like is his own what like his own version of cursive. So like like as if they were all connected, it just all flowed so smoothly. I mean, there were word, uh, you know, distinct words there. It wasn't all just one smooth line of connected letters. So it, it was in in a script of sorts, but it was all written smoothly out as one word where if you had to look at a cipher to determine what you were writing for sure there would be you know just a a tiny little break dot of ink or something like that you know what i mean i got you i see what you mean uh so only a few of the words like we said are not of this unknown script there's a, a small sequence of latin letters there are there's a a series of diagrams in the astro- uh, astronomical section that has the names of the 10 months from March to December written in Latin script. A uh, small number of words are in High German, which is, is an ancient German, that read as Der Muse Del, which is a phrase for a widow's share. Hmm. And, uh, and that's it as far as that. There have been, of course, there have been attempts to transcribe and to code break. So there is, and you can look this up online, there's a European Voynich alphabet where they take every, uh, every character that they could find and they found a spot for it in the European uh, IER alphabet. But... Yeah. This was first brought to light in the 1940s where it was so fucking hard to do that they had to make... They, it had to be transcribed to an IBM punch card to make it machine readable. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me, and, that just came out of nowhere. <coughs> and this... This... Uh, this, uh, this alphabet with the transcription symbols and things like that is it's so it's in some parts it makes sense in most others it makes no sense which means the the only conclusion i can i can gather from that is that the parts that we think make sense is just it's just us wanting it to make sense making mm-hmm. it make sense even it's like what's it called when you can see faces in things oh, that aren't a face. Fuck, para something. But you know what I'm uh, talking about. Yeah, it's, I know it's, exactly what you mean. It's seeing the, the elephant that is dancing on a, a giant ball that is also shooting heroin between his toes in the clouds. Yeah. You're seeing a, that because your elephant. mind wanted to see that. It's mm-hmm. not necessarily a bad elephant. It's just a, I, it's a bad influence. I want you to stop hanging around with that elephant, Chris, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's, he's the, <laughs> he's you don't the, need to be hanging around with elephants that are dancing on top of balls. Jesus. A bad elephant. If I tell you that one more time, it'll be the last. It will. And then mm. I won't hear any more of it. No, because I'll forget about it. Mm. <clears throat> so. so hmm uh, so it's, it's it's almost as if, uh, you know, if you take that portion away from it, it's almost as if this guy or whoever wrote this not only 
made up his own alphabet, but made up the alphabet to go along with the language he also made up. So if you put it out to any known alphabets that we have, even if it seems like it fits, it's not going to spell anything in any language. Right, 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 right. Because you made the shit up. Exactly. And the the, the craziest thing about that is with... I I mean, because in the 1400s, most, if not all, of Europe was was using uh, at least a derivative of Latin for the most part. (laughs) So... coming up with something wholly unique out of that time period is so especially astoundingly special right Anomalous. that the fact that the fact that it didn't catch on in one way or another somewhere else is somewhat shocking alone cuz it's not gibberish that it's not this guy didn't sit down and just write a bunch of pretty calligraphy that people are mistaking as a language. Th- this says something. It absolutely right. says something. So the fact that there hasn't ever been another book that has this language in it or that there's never been a, it's fucking anything found <laughs> that's anything like this not it's, even like practice scratch paper or exactly anything exactly <laughs> so this is the one and only at least surviving piece that right. has so this is the this beginning in- and the end <laughs> absolutely holy shit did your cat just play the piano yeah no nah. The the computer made a noise, and now the cat's bitching because she's starving because she's had an upset tummy lately, and she's Aww. tried she's been throwing up all over the fucking truck. So Aww. I'm not I'm not feeding her until you know. Right? Is she? I mean, is she okay uh, for the most part? Is she is she okay? Yeah, she seems fine. I think she's just been constipated, so it it makes uh. her throw up as well if she can't. I don't you know, know. She's also that, old and yeah. That that shows me that your your cat actually has a lot in common with uh with baby Vera. Uh <laughs> she's been constipated, so she's been throwing up a whole bunch. Yep. Yeah. It's time and for and her she's been making lot lots of lots of fussy noises too. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh so. t- t- tell tell Raina that I I love her and that I hope she's doing well. Well, sorry out there, kids, if uh, this episode is full of meows Aww. like that. Well, you know what? An episode full of meows is certainly better than an episode full of Darcy barks. True. True. So, true. so let's talk about statistical patterns. You ready? Yes, let's. Okay, this, tes- this text consists of over 170,000 characters with spaces wow. dividing the text into about 35,000 groups of varying length. They're usually referred to as words or word tokens. There are 8,114 that are considered unique word types. The structure of these words seem to follow uh, phonological or orthographic laws of some sort. Examples of those would be uh, certain characters must appear <clears throat> certain characters must appear in each word just like English vowels do also some characters never follow others or some may be doubled or triples but others right. may not be so just like I before E except after uh, P or I don't remember what that is or how every single word in the English language has to have a vowel in it it follows certain laws like that. Gotcha. <clears throat> Which seems like it would be somewhat of an aha moment, but Take On Me hasn't been written uh, <sighs> for hundreds of years. So yeah. we can't have an aha moment yet. Indeed. I see where you yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm follow. So the distribution of these letters also, it's kind of weird. Some characters occur only at the beginning of a word, some only at the end, and some always in the middle. There was a professor, Gonzalo Rubo, uh, Rubio, my, my mistake, 
who was an expert in ancient languages at Penn State, who said the things we know as grammatical markers, things that occur commonly at the beginning or end of words, such as S's or D in our language, and that are used to express grammar, never appear in the middle of words in the Voynich manuscript. That's unheard of for any Indo-European, Hungarian, or Finnish language. <laughs> and uh, many researchers have commented upon the highly regular structure of the words, which leads me back to what I was saying, that these are absolutely words. They can't be gibberish because there's a rhyme and reason. There are rules to how these words are written. Right. So the, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the distribution of the letters within the text is also strange. Stephen Von Felt studied some statistical properties of the distribution of letters and their correlations, which are properties that can be vaguely characterized as rhythmic resonance, alliteration, or assonance, and found that under that respect, it, the language within the Voynich manuscript is referred to as Voynichese, just <laughs> to let you know, <laughs> like Chinese, wow. but Voynich. How clever so, of them. Indeed. So, Voynichese <clears throat> is, is more similar to Chinese than European languages, although... It sounds the, spicy. Although the numerical differences between Voynichese and Chinese look larger than those between Chinese and the European language. So, what this is saying is, it's, it, it seems to be closer to Chinese than English, but is technically... Fur Voynichis itself is technically further away, um, relationship-wise, from Chinese than even English is to Chinese, if that makes Good any Lord. sense. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of get how that could be determined. So, uh, this thing was... Uh, like, how did we get it? How do we... Was it found? Was it... Did, was it in someone's private collection? Did it just pop up on the market somewhere? Like, what the fuck... Where did it come from? How do we know anything? We we do. We do. We we have uh, a history dating back to a certain point of the book. And and we we're, we're about to get to that. We 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 certainly certainly get in the, just, just a minute. Oh, it's going to be uh -huh. so sweet. You got to let you got you got you got to let the you got to let the heads. You got to let them you got to let them boil so that we get that that beautiful beautiful oh man, that bisque base that's just right. ready to mm. knock your socks off. Then we strain them out, mm. and then we grind them up, and mm -hmm. we pass it back through and strain it. Oh, oh anyway. man, we do all the <sighs> way to cheesecloth level, and then you're just like, I got, now I'm going to snort what's left. Mm. Well, kids, he's got the tip in. Might as well just let him slide the rest. Let's go. Mwah, like I said. So practically no <laughs> words have fewer than two letters or more than ten. Some words occur in only certain sections or in only a few pages. Others occur throughout the whole manuscript. There are very few repetitions among the thousand or so labels attached to the illustrations. There are instances where the same common word appears up to three times in a row. Words <laughs> that differ by only one letter also repeat with unusual frequency, causing single substitution alphabet decipherings to yield babel-like text. In 1962... Cryptanalyst Elizabeth Friedman describes such attempts as doomed to utter frustration. So it, it, <laughs> what's fun about it is that it almost seems like like whatever was used to make this this language up was created just to piss people off that were trying to decipher it. And it's, it's entirely possible. This could be like the very first. Well, one of the first pranks where the person just went clearly Way too astronomically far. above <laughs> and beyond. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> just to be a dick to history. Exactly. Not just to have a laugh, but to have a laugh and kick somebody in the balls at the same time. Oh my god. Forever. But uh, but but I mean do his do, does it does this person's family even get to, you know, revel in the in the laugh for history? We'll have to see. We will just have to see. Because wow. moving past the st statistical such and suches, let's talk about some of the cool little illustrations that are within this book. Mm -hmm. The illustrations are Is conventionally there used. Uh, there are quite a lot of boobies, Chris. 
Yes. <laughs> um, not even just I'll not even a lot. There's them. there's like a bunch. So yeah. they're usually used to divide most of the manuscript into six different sections. Since the text itself can't be read, each section is typified by the illustrations with different styles and subject matter. Except for the last section in which the only drawings are small stars in the margin. Like we said, he would sometimes draw these little stars. Uh, some some think as uh, ac- you know a, a sort of punctuation or things like that. Or sometimes there were just little stars in the margins because they did that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the names of these folios are, are these sections are so we have the herbal ones there's 112 folios uh, each page displays one or two plants and a few paragraphs of text a format typical of the European herbals of the time some parts of these drawings are larger and cleaner copies of sketches seen in the pharmaceutical section none of the plants depicted are unambiguously identifiable do you know what that means? Uh, not real yeah, none of them are real. So, wow. There, 112 pages of plants with paragraphs depicting each that are made up. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, not going to start my speculations yet. Continue, please. That this Good. Is crazy. Next section. Astronomical. There are 21 folios. They contain circular diagrams suggested of astronomy or astrology. Some have suns, moons, and stars. Uh, one series of 12 diagrams depicts conventional symbols for these uh, zodiacal? Zo- <laughs> Z- zodiacal. Z- uh, zodiacal. I like that word, and I hate it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. yeah. Zodiacal <laughs> constellations. Uh, two fish for Pisces. A bull for Taurus, a hunter with a crossbow for Sagittarius, etc. Each of these has 30 female figures arranged in two or more concentric bands. Most of the females Each of these are at least female figures had boobies. Most of the females are at least part partly nude. Each holds what appears to be a labeled star or is shown with the star attached to either arm <laughs> by what could be a tether or cord of some kind. Uh, the last two pages. Tassels. Uh you know. I'm I'm gonna go ahead and say that there's probably at least one. Oh, I was thinking stars and a cord. And a, uh, okay, continue. I'm I was sorry. thinking hearts, stars, horseshoes, clovers, and blue moons. Mm-hmm. Something, something, rainbows and the red balloons. Pots of gold and rainbows. Oh. And the red balloons. I'm gonna get that little fucking freak, and I'm gonna steal his goddamn lucky charms. And yeah. you know, when I was a kid. Lucky Charms mush- uh, mushrooms, I was about to say, marshmallows in the cereal were the greatest things in the world to me. I would just eat the marshmallows and leave all the oh, yeah. shitty, gross cereal parts in it. I still do. No, today Jason hates those marshmallows and only what? eats <laughs> the other parts of it. I just It's just something about it. It's just not... It's well, just the not. super yummy... Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I just, I just, I'm, I was done. I just don't like it. Nah, fuck those marshmallows up, dude. The super yummy fucking cereals in a bag at Walmart and shit. Now yeah. they come with marshmallows mm. in everything. So you can get the crunch berries with the marshmallows. Sweet. You can get the fucking cocoa puffs with the marshmallows. <laughs> you can get both the different crunch berries, uh, like uh, pebbles, the cocoa mm-hmm. or the cr- Fruity Pebbles with I was, the marshmallows. I was, actually, I was actually just about to say my, my absolute favorite cereal on the planet is the 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 great value bag, huge things off name brand of Fruity Pebbles. It's just Fuck so good. Yeah. It's just Fuck so good. Yeah. It's, it just you, gets soggier faster than, than regular, but if you eat it fast enough, it's exactly like the goddamn same thing. Well, uh, thanks to the internet, if you really want to be a fat bitch, you can order a bag of just straight up cereal marshmallows. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to do that. Fat bitch. You're a fat bitch. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to stop myself from doing that. <laughs> I fuck some marshmallows I, up, dude. I haven't been successful, but I've been trying to stop myself. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I'll go up in the convenience store in a coffee section, and the ones uh-huh. that have the little shaky things of the little baby mini marshmallows, and I'll shake like 
an extra cup hmm. of just marshmallows. I did not know. I've I've never seen that before. I've never seen a a marshmallow shaker. It's at rare gas nowadays. I I think it was rare all days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, they don't so, like you guys in New Orleans in the first place. So where so we don't left off to see one. is that we had. 30 female figures arranged in two or more concentric bands on each of these uh, pages for the Zodiacal Constellations. Mm-hmm. So the last two pages of this section were lost, which were Aquarius and Capricornus, roughly oh. January January and February, while Aries and Taurus are split into four paired diagrams with 15 women and 15 stars each. Mm. Those motherfuckers. Mm-hmm. Some of these diagrams Aries are on Taurus. fold-out pages. Matter of fact, the cover art for this week's episode is one of the the larger foldouts in the astronomical uh, section of the book. You can't really see a whole lot of it, but you can get kind of a good idea of the art style and what was trying to be conveyed with it. Aries are buttheads. Mm Mm-hmm. They don't know them. Well, see, they were still there. They're like, I'm an Aquarius, and, and... and Melissa, See? you're you're an Aquarius or Capricorn? Capricorn, yeah. And so Not both of ours ain't in the shit. Yeah, let's see. Mm. Aries and Taurus can share. <sighs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So the next section was biological, which had 20 folios. A dense, continuous text interspersed with figures, mostly showing small nude women, some wearing crowns, bathing in pools or tubs connected by an elaborate network of pipes. The bifolio consists of folios 78 and 81 it forms an integrated design with water flowing from one folio to the other so intentionally and intentionally connecting each with uh, a fun somewhat uh, of uh, a water slide of of very short squat naked ladies with crowns and such Contitas. yeah yeah, corn chippas, like he said. <laughs> so the next section is cosmological. There are 13 folios, more circular diagrams, but they're of an obscure nature. It also has foldouts. One of them spans six pages, commonly called the Rosettes folio, and contains a map or diagram with nine islands or rosettes connected by causeways and containing castles as well of, as, well as what might be a volcano. The next section is the pharmaceutical. It has 34 folios. They have many label drawings of isolated plant parts, such as roots, leaves, etc. Objects resembling apoc- mm, apothecary jars, ranging in styles from the mundane to the fantastical. And a few texts of paragraph. Uh, to, <laughs> a few paragraphs of text. The next, yeah, that makes more sense. The, the, the next and final is Recipes, which has 22 folios. Full pages of text broken into many short paragraphs, each marked with a star in the left margin. Using ingredients so, that don't fucking exist. So five folios contain only texts, and at least 28 folios are missing from the manuscript as a whole. So, what is <laughs> the purpose of this book? You ready to get into some some much, 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 much smarter than we speculation on the purpose of this book? Sure. Sweet, because that's what I'm going to do anyway. The overall impression by the uh, given by the surviving leaves of the manuscript is that it was meant to be a sort of pharmacopoeia to address topics in early medieval medicine. But... Mm-hmm. The puzzling details of the illustrations just make more questions because mm-hmm. if this was intended to actually be a pharmacopoeia, then it is useless because whoever wrote it is a moron because these <laughs> things don't actually exist. Right. So, <laughs> weird. The the, first se- mm-hmm. Yeah, the first section of the book is almost completely uh, herbal, but... Y- no one fucking is, is able to identify the plants with actual specimens or with the stylized uh, drawings that are there. So only a few of the plants can be identified at all with reasonable certainty, such as a wild pansy and the maidenhair fern, 
the herbal pictures that match pharmacological sketches appear to be like just clean copies of them except that missing parts were completed with improbable looking details so it, they just added fantastical shit to shit that wasn't fantastical to make something oh that's neat um it's starting to feel kind of like um the episodes that we did with the vampires and the werewolves and stuff a little bit yes yes a little bit but the cooler thing about this is that we've known about it for hundreds of years so Mm -hmm. this isn't just some you know art school dropouts you know claim for fame this is even if it was an art school dropouts claim for fame in the 1400s it is now a a proper fucking mystery of an ancient book seriously Mm -hmm. so mystery so one of the neat things in this is that in the herbal section in particular there seem to be composites so like you'll have the roots of one species that is stapled onto the leaves of another with the flowers from yet another <laughs> and yeah so that there's a botanist named uh, Hugh O'Neill and he believed that one of the il- illustrations depicted a new world sunflower which would help date the manuscript and open up intriguing possibilities for its origin unfortunately this is just speculation so the basins and tubes and shit that are in the biological section are sometimes interpreted as implying a connection to alchemy. Yet, they bear little obvious resemblance to the alchemical equipment of the period. So, <laughs> just another question mark. The astrological considerations frequently played a prominent role in herb gathering bloodletting and other medical procedures common during the likely estates of the manuscript however interpretations remain speculative of course apart from the obvious zodiac symbols and one diagram possibly showing classical planets you know like uh there's the mozart planet and then there's like the beethoven planet and right yeah it's, it's the classical planets um they they're not very fun <laughs> they're pretty but they they're I mean, what are you gonna do there you know you can, you know, I can skateboard uh, and eat fucking moon cheese there, because none of those things have been invented yet. You're just gonna That's listen true. to the fucking clavicle, clavier, the keyboard. Mm. You ready to get into the history of the book? I know you are. You know I already am, asked girl. me about it. Ooh, girl. So, for, mm, like I said before. Much of the earliest history of the book is completely fucking unknown, though the text and illustrations are all characteristically European. In 2009, University of Arizona, which we have already stated no one cares about, their researchers performed a radiocarbon dating, blah blah blah, to make it 1404 and 1438. But, but, the first confirmed, the first confirmed owner was... Uh, I like butts. It was George Barish, who was an obscure alchemist from Prague. Barish was apparently just as fucking perplexed as modern scientists about what he called uh, this sphinx that had been taking up space uselessly in his library for many years. He eventually no. learned that... Mm-hmm. No, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 ask away, please. Well, I was going to ask where it gets the name Voynich. Mm. You will find that out. So, he learned that Jesuit scholar uh, and Anth- hmm, Anthanasius Kircher from the Collegio Romano had published a Coptic, which is uh, Egyptian, dictionary and claimed to have deciphered the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Barish twice sent a sample copy of the script to Kircher in Rome asking for clues. His 1639 letter to Kircher is the earliest confirmed mention of the manuscript that has ever been found. Hmm. So, if we think this book was written 1404 to 1439, and this letter to Kircher in Rome asking for help to decipher it was written 1639, and it is the first... And only 
it is the earliest anything we have that mentions this manuscript at all is 200 years two 200 plus years after we know it existed that's crazy it, so it yeah it is sitting in somebody's collection taking up space mm-hmm. just like in his exactly <coughs> exactly so but we don't know how he got it or anything no no. <clears throat> I, Weird. So whether Kirscher actually answered this request, nobody knows. But he was interested enough to try to to acquire the book. So that, but the guy that already owned it, Barish, he refused to sell. But upon his death, the manuscript passed to his friend uh, Jan Merrick Marcy, who was also known as Johann Marcus Marcy. Uh, he was the rector of Charles University in Prague. A few years later, Marcy sent, Marcy sent the book to Kirscher, who was his longtime friend. So, a letter written on August 19th, 1665, or 66, was found inside the cover and accompanied the manuscript when Johann Marcus sent it to Kirscher. It claimed that the book once belonged to Emperor Rudolf II, who paid 600 gold ducats, which is about 2.7, uh, 2.07 kilograms of gold for it. Damn. The letter was written in Kilograms? Latin. Kilograms? God damn. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> the, the letter was in Latin and had been translated to English. The book was then given or lent to Jacobus Hickory, uh, Jacobus Horsicki de Tepenenses. T E P E N E C Z. Who was yeah, the no. head of, he was the head of uh, Emperor Rudolph's botanical gardens in Prague probably as part of a debt that Rudolph owed upon his death. So Marcy's 65 or 66 cover letter written in Latin was still in the manuscript when Mr. Voynich purchased it years (laughs) and years later. The letter read, Reverend and distinguished sir, father in Christ, this book bequeathed to me by an intimate friend, I destined for you, my very dear Anthony." And then see us. As soon as it came into my possession, for I was convinced that it could be read by no one except yourself. The former owner of this book asked your opinion by letter, copying and sending you a portion of the book from which he believed you would be able to read the remainder. But he at the time refused to send the book itself. To its deciphering, he devoted unflagging toil, as is apparent from attempts of which I send you here with and he relinquished hope only with his life. But his toil was in vain, for such sphinxes as these obey no one but their master, Kersher. Except now this token, such as it is, and long overdue though it be, of my affection for you, and burst through its bars, if there are any, with your wonted success. Dr. Raphael, a tutor in the... Be- Dr. Raphael, a tutor in the Bohemian language to Ferdinand III, then King of Bohemia told me the said book belonged to the Emperor Rudolph and that he presented to the bearer who brought him the book 600 ducats. He believed the author was Roger Bacon, an Englishman. On this point, I suspend judgment. It's your place to define for us what view we should take therein. To whose favor and kindness I unreservedly commit myself and remain at the command of your reverence, Johann Marcus Marcy of Kronland. Prague, nineteenth August. Hmm. So, there's a lot of bacon uh, in history, isn't there? A yeah, lot of them motherfuckers. Yeah, which is weird because, because it's well, no, it's not weird because bacon's great. <laughs> bacon's just good stuff, and that's all I have to say about that. So, Agreed. after that, after that writing, we get another two hundred years before. We hear about it again. Wow. <laughs> how, how crazy is that? So uh, no records at all of the book exists for the next 200 years. This but is crazy. In all likelihood, it was just stored with all of Kirscher's uh, correspondence in, in the library of the uh, Collegio Romano, So, which is now, uh, if, if you needed to know, the Pontifical Gregorian University. <laughs> And 
probably remain there until the troops of Victor Emmanuel II of Italy captured the city in 1870 and annexed the Papal States. <laughs> so the, the new Italian government decided to confiscate as many properties of the church uh, as they could, which included the, the library, uh, all the books that they could, uh, a lot of art and things like that. And according to investigations by Xavier Cisaldi and others, those books were exempt from confiscation, the, the, the books in, um, in personal libraries. So what they would do is the, 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 the professors and, and, and priests at this college would take as many old manuscripts as they could and transfer them into their own personal libraries, which were then at least supposed to be off limits by the the, the invading uh, or the the new reigning Italian government, which is kind of kind of neat that 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 they even you know said that that was okay. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, so, agreed. Um, so Kircher had correspondence among a bunch of books, and apparently the Voynich manuscript, as it still bears the ex libris of Petrus Beckix, head of the Jesuit order and the university's rector at the time, they had, they basically figured it out that the head of the order took it into his own private library, which was then moved to the Villa Mondragon Frascati, which is a large country palace near Rome that had been bought by the Society of Jesuit, uh, the Society of Jesus, my bad, <laughs> in 1866, and it housed the headquarters of the Jesuits' Uh, Gisleri College. You know, okay. Italian looks hard and stuff, but like, if you just say like the word once or twice, it's not so bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's but not the so so bad and uh, spicy um, uh, <laughs> meatball words. I'm a Mario. See, I bet you, you, I bet are. you just you thought that some Italian man had walked in and, and took the show over. <sighs> You Shut up. would have lost that bet. However, um, no, I believe that the, the, it is not a, that difficult a language to learn. No, I mean, In I don't scheme. want to say learn, but you could probably learn conjugation of it. Not that super hard. Pronouncing, pronunciation, I mean. Indeed. So, <clears> in, <throat> so in 1903, the Society of Jesus was short of money, which is weird that Jesus always needs so much money. Um and he just they decided to sell a lot of its stuff discreetly. That's always to... struck me as odd too, by the way. <laughs> they they sold a bunch of their shit to the Vatican, basically. Um the sale took place in nineteen twelve, but not all of the manuscripts listed for sale actually ended up going to the to the Vatican. Uh Wilfred Voynich had acquired thirty of these manuscripts, among them the one which now bears his name. He spent the next seven years attempting to interest scholars in deciphering the script while he worked to determine the origins of it. In 1930, the manuscript was inherited after Wilfred's death by his widow, uh, who was Ethel Voynich. She authored the novel The Gadfly and the daughter of mathematician George Boole. Uh, she then died in 1960 and left the manuscript to her close friend Anne Nill, who then sold it to book dealer Hans P. Krauss, then Krauss couldn't find a buyer, and he donated it to Yale in 1969, where it was cataloged as MS-408, also sometimes referred to as uh, Binicle MS-408. And that's where it is today. The book today is in Yale University's library. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's quite a journey. So uh, there is a uh, a timeline. Uh, there's like a little a little graph, uh, you know, visual dealy about the timeline of this book's life. So it starts in 1400, where we have creation, somewhere between 1400 and 1430, whatever. And then after that point, we have a long ass line that just says unknown, all the way to just before 1600. Then we have a tiny little Rudolph the second. A uh, tinier Jacobus de Timbenetis, then a tiny little unknown, tiny little George Barish, tiny little Jan Merrick Marcy, tiny little Anthonisius Kircher, then the Collegio Romano has it from, uh, let's see, just before 1700 to uh, about 1890, 
Then uh, Frascati, with a question mark after it, has it... <clears throat> so I'm, that's the... Uh, anyway, from for about 100 years. Then Wilfried Vornich, Ethel Vornich, and Nil Hans P. Krauss, and now the Yale Library. Yay! Wow. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> now we get into the funness, okay? Because we have about a half hour left. Not that this hasn't been super fun. <sighs> you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay, because this is where we get to find out what uh, super smart people think uh, the book might actually uh, have to do with. Wait, I thought we already <laughs> did that. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. That was speculation on where and why and how and such. But now we talk about the hypotheses that have been developed about the manuscript's language, which I is see. Voynichese. Voynichese. So, According to the letter-based cipher theory, the Voynich manuscript contains meaningful text in some European language that was intentionally rendered obscure by mapping it to the Voynich manuscript alphabet through a cipher of some sort, uh, an, algori an algorithm that operated on individual letters. This was the working hypothesis for most of the 20th century and all of their deciphering attempts, including an informal team of NSA cryptographers led by William F. Friedman in the early 50s. The main argument for this theory is that it's difficult to explain a European author using a strange alphabet. So they may have used a code and a cipher and things, but using a completely new alphabet that's not the European alphabet is kind of fucking unheard of. All right. <laughs> so indeed, even Roger Bacon knew about ciphers and the estimated date for the manuscript roughly coincides with the birth of cryptography in Europe as a relatively... Uh, systematic discipline so you know it as something that is widely used to hide secrets this is about when it started getting you know kind of big so um, wait that's two bacons in this story no that's the original bacon that oh. some some speculate is the author of the book but we have no I mean, absolutely nothing saying that he is nothing hmm so, the counter-argument to this is that almost all cipher systems consistent with that era completely fail to match what is seen in the actual Voynich manuscript. So, for example, simple substitution ciphers would be excluded because the distribution of letter frequencies doesn't resemble that of any known language, while the small number of different letter shapes used implies that nomenclature and uh, homophonic ciphers would be ruled out because they're typically employed uh, with larger cipher alphabets. Now we have uh, polyalphabetical ciphers that were invented by Alberti in the 1460s, and they included the later uh, Visionaire cipher, but they usually yield ciphertext where all cipher shapes occur with roughly equal probability, unlike the language-like letter distribution of the Voynich manuscript. <clears throat> so in other words... They it would be a more mathematical looking uh, text than it would be th than it than it would look like a natural language text as it does. Okay. So <clears throat> there there is a presence of many tightly grouped shapes in the manuscript, such as or or o r a r o l a l a n a i n. A I I N A I R A I I R A M E E E E E, among others, hmm. that suggests that its cipher system might make use of a verbose cipher, where single letters in a plain text get enciphered into groups of fake letters. So, for example, the first two lines of page F fifteen V contain, uh, and this is in quotes, O R O R. Next word, O R, and uh, o R next word O R next word O R O next word R, and hmm. they say here that it strongly resembles how Roman numbers such as C C C or X X X X would look if uh, verbosely enciphered. So, the encryption system started from a fundamentally simple cipher and then augmented it by adding nulls, which is the spaces in between, so meaningless symbols added in. Uh, Homophones, which are duplicate symbols, 
transposition ciphers, which are letter rearrangement, false word breaks, and more, are also just completely (laughs) plausible and possible because anything is as far as this goes. Right. So as far as codes go, according to the codebook cipher theory, the manuscript's words would actually be codes to be looked up in some kind of dictionary or like a code book. So the main evidence for this theory is that the internal structure and length distribution of many of the words are similar to those of Roman numerals, which at the time would be a natural choice for the codes. However, book-based ciphers would be viable for only very short messages because they are very cumbersome to write and read. So in, in this, instead of the word being a word, it would be a code to look up a passage or a word in a completely separate book. Right. Which something of of this size would be fucking insane to do that way. Uh, It could be uh, shorthand of of some sort. In 1943, Joseph Martin Freely claimed that the manuscript was a scientific diary written in shorthand. According to D. Imperio, this was Latin but in a system of abbreviated forms not considered acceptable by other scholars who unanimously reject his readings of the text. So in other words, no, it's not, you stupid idiot. (laughs) Next next theory is uh, it could be uh, stenography. Uh, the, The theory holds that the text of the manuscript is mostly meaningless, but contains meaningful information hidden in inconspicuous details like uh, the second letter of every word or the number of letters in each line. This technique is called stenography and is super old <laughs> and uh, was described by Johann Trithmius uh, in 1499. Uh, the plain text was speculated to have been extracted by a Cardin grill, which is an overlay with cutouts for the meaningful text. So in other words, each of these pages would have... Uh, a page that you would put over it and cutouts in this this over page would then reveal what the actual message within was i see uh wow yeah <laughs> but the way that this is written in freehand on uh so the 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 lines of the sentences and paragraphs and things like that aren't perfectly straight and they're not in uh, they're not in a grid setup where you could have some kind of cutout sheet over it that would make any sense because there would just be parts of the line that wouldn't show up in it and and things I like see. that so that's uh, while still <laughs> somewhat plausible is very unlikely okay this could also have been a natural language. Uh, there's analysis of the text that reveals patterns that are very similar to, to those of a natural language. For, entrance, uh, for instance, the word entropy, which apparently is about 10 bits per word, is similar to that of English or Latin texts. In 2013, uh, Daigo Amancio et al., argued that the Voynich manuscript is mostly compatible with natural languages as and incompatible with random texts. Uh, the linguist Jacques Guy once suggested that the Voynich manuscript text could be some little-known natural language written in the plain with an invented alphabet. The word structure is similar to that of many language families of East and Central Asia, uh, mainly Sino-Tibetan, Chinese, Tibetan, and Burmese. Um, Osti... Austroasiatic, which is Vietnamese, uh, Khmer, and possibly Thai, which would include Thai and, and Laos. In many of these languages, the words have only one syllable, and syllables have a rather rich structure, including tonal patterns. This theory has some historical plausibility. While those languages generally have uh, native scripts, they were ridiculously difficult for Western visitors to read. So this could be a... Uh, it, this could be like an invention alphabet and language, or this could be an invention alphabet and way of writing a already established natural language in uh, in phonetic scripts, basically, with mostly huh. Latin letters, so that people that aren't from there could more easily uh, get a grasp of it. 
Interesting. And it goes further into to that, uh, but ends up with basically a, you know, maybe. I don't know. It could also be a constructed language. So instead of a natural one, just a completely constructed one. And right. uh, it could also very much just be a hoax. <laughs> The hoax thing is just so... It's its no more a stretch than any of the other options, but the possibility that, that, that someone... You know, you think about the time period, and you think about how much these things would have cost, you mm-hmm. know, how, how much, like, what kind of ink, you know, there's, there's, there were obviously higher and lower grades of the ink as well as the pipe the paper and all that other shit you know the right. way it was binded the techniques and all that other kind of shit let alone the time it would take that's the biggest thing to me to do this is the time factor cuz it if this were just some weird stupid hoax joke that somebody was doing in their in their spare time it would have taken fucking decades to do. Well, yeah, but I mean, at the same time, think of all that fucking money. Who has that kind of money to just throw into something that's just a hoax that they're not even going to fucking give to anybody or sell to anybody mm-hmm. or nothing? Well, I mean, you know I guess I mean? I, Dire Straits, I guess, uh, they, they had all that money for nothing and their chicks for free. So. Could be. Could that be. Would, that, that would explain the, the, the many, many drawings of, of squat, ugly, naked lady. <laughs> in, in the book, so you know it's um, it's wolf all good. Wolf bush. It's all good. <laughs> uh, so there's one more little uh, section of this before we get to people's attempts at uh, at actually saying that they maybe deciphered shit. And this is this is kind of my favorite here. Um, the gloss ola lia. The glossola. <laughs> the glossola lia. La Solalia, which is the possibility that this Voynich manuscript was uh, a case of writing down, uh, uh, how do you say, like a channeling, like a, a stream of consciousness speaking in tongues, writing it down, <laughs> which is very, <laughs> is very unlikely for reasons like I, I said a hundred times already that it's just so well written and so intentionally written that if it just couldn't have the same like if you were writing in tongues you wouldn't have the the resurgence of exact same words you know what I mean not to mention it being like with no flaws. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's it's so it's so beautifully done that that's kind of ridiculous. So it's very deliberate. With the last ten minutes of the show, we're gonna get into the decipherment claims of this, and we're I'm gonna go through real quick and tell you who did it and what they think they did, and then we're gonna go to the next. So okay, because it's cold. It's well, it's starting to get cold. <laughs> okay, William Romain Newbold. Uh, he had one of the earliest uh, attempts to do so, and it was done in 1921. His is one of the more interesting ones in that he didn't think the letters or words themselves were letters or words, but under very close magnification, you could see uh, markings that were supposed to be based on an ancient Greek shorthand that were forming a second level of script that held the real content of the writing. So he used, yeah, (laughs) Uh, he claimed to have had used this knowledge to work out entire paragraphs, providing the authorship of Bacon and recording his use of a compound microscope. So he he says that that not only did the dude Bacon write this book, but he used a compound microscope to write the book 400 years before it was invented. Get the fuck out of (laughs) here. And... A circular drawing in the astronomical section depicts an irregularly shaped object with four curved arms, which Newbold interpreted as a picture of the galaxy, which could be obtained only with a telescope, which they did not have. So that's that's a neat one. 
Uh, and so there is. He, he said, if you zoom in on the letters themselves, there are more letters in each one of them that spell out the actual not, message. No, there's not more letters, but there are a series of markings which can then be interpreted as a form of ancient Greek shorthand writing. I gotcha. Okay. Now there there Talking is weird, actual yeah. evidence of of this mycography being used. Even in ancient times, uh, the Hebrew language can be traced as far back as the 9th century. It's nowhere near as compact or complex as the shapes that he made out, but there have been writings and manuscripts with, with this as a system. But close hmm. study of the manuscript revealed that most of these markings that he was reading are just artifacts caused by the way that ink cracks as it dries on rough vellum. So they're not intentionally left... Uh, markings of any kind. It's just all coincidental shit that he said, this is what it means! I'm crazy cool. guy! Next guy in 1943 <clears throat> is Joseph Martin Feely. He published a book, Roger Bacon's Cipher, The Right Key Found, in which he claimed that the book was a scientific diary written by Roger Bacon. His method posited that the text was a highly abbreviated medieval Latin written in a si simple substitution cipher. Next. So, like, text talk Latin. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like uh, leet speak. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, next we have Lionel C. Strong, a cancer researcher uh, that, oh, a cancer research scientist and amateur cryptographer who believed that the solution was a peculiar double system of arithmetical progressions of a multiple alphabet. Okay. <sighs> uh, which is 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 bullshit. Um, <laughs> Robert S. Uh, Brumbra in 1978. He was a professor of medieval uh, uh, philosophy at Yale. He claimed that the manuscript was a forgery intended to fool Emperor Rudolf II into purchasing it, and that the Latin or, or that the text is Latin enciphered with a complex two-step method. So. Next is John Stoj Stojko, S-T-O-J-K-O. In 1978, he published Letters to God's Eye, where he claimed that the manuscript was a series of letters written in vowelless Ukrainian. The theory caused some sensation among Ukrainian dysphoria at the time, and then in independent Ukraine after 1991. However, the date he gives for the letters, the lack of relation... <clears throat> between the text and the images and the looseness in the method of decryption all says that it's bullshit. But I kind of yeah. like that. Uh, vowelless Ukrainian. <laughs> I feel like the guy just before this dude, though, I feel like he's he's like that guy that goes, oh, yeah, no, it's simple. I already figured it out. Well, then why don't you mm -hmm. fucking help us out and decipher it? Because I don't want to. I've got other, no, cause, I, cause I got other like, stuff to do. I mean, because I already got it, and I mean, you guys should probably just figure it out for yourselves and shit. Just, yeah, you know, yeah. Just stop being fags about it, God. Because <laughs> cause mom's making chicken nuggets and bagel pizzas that night. Yeah, and then my girlfriend's coming over, and we're gonna <laughs> do we're gonna do some heavy petting. My girlfriend, that's totally from Canada. <laughs> yeah, and and real at the same time. <laughs> that's it, totally real. Totally she's real. Gonna come over, and we're gonna play video games. <laughs> oh man, because she. She's 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 so good. Leo oh Lev Leo Levitov uh in 1987 proposed in his book Solution of the Voynich Manuscript a liturgical manual for the Endura rite of the Cathari heresy the cult of Isis. That's the name of the book. Ooh. Uh that the manuscript is a handbook for the Cathar rite of Endura written in a Flemish based creole. He further claimed that uh, Catharsism was descended from the cult of Isis. However, his decipherment has uh, been refuted on several grounds, not least of which it is uh, completely unhistorical. Uh, Levitov had a, he had a poor grasp on the history of the Cathars, and his depiction of Endura as an elaborate suicide ritual is at pretty serious odds with surviving documents describing it as a simple fast. Uh, likewise, there's no link between Catharsism and ISIS. <sighs> okay, Stephen Bax in that. 2014 
Applied Linguistics Professor Stephen Bax published an article in conjunction with the Swedish-Australian linguist Sean R. L. King, in which they claim to have translated ten words from the manuscript using techniques similar to those used to successfully translate in Egyptian hieroglyphs. They claim the manuscript to be a treatise on nature in a Near Eastern or Asian language, but no full translation was made before Stephen Bax's death in 2017. All right, so Nicholas Gibbs in September of 2017 was a television writer who claimed to have decoded the manuscript as <laughs> idiosyncratically abbreviated Latin. He claimed the manuscript to be a mostly plagiarized guide to women's health. Medieval scholars judged <laughs> Gibbs' hypothesis to be not very novel. <laughs> His work was criticized as patching together already existing scholarship and providing a highly speculative and incorrect translation. We um, did not find that, this funny, sir. Yeah, that this later that this lady uh, who was uh, the director of Medieval Academy of America uh, in, in languages says that uh, his decipherment doesn't result in Latin that makes any fucking sense. <laughs> Okay, and the last but not least, we go to Greg Kondrak. Professor Greg Kondrak, a natural language pro uh, processing ex expert at the University of Alberta, together with his graduate student Bradley Hauer, used artificial intelligence in an attempt to decode the manuscript. Their findings were presented at the annual meeting of the Association for Computational Linguistics in 2017 in the form of an article suggesting that the language of the manuscript is most likely Hebrew, but encoded using alphagrams, which are alphabetically ordered anagrams. However, the team admitted that experts in medieval manuscripts who reviewed the work were not completely convinced. The claim is also disputed by an expert in Hebrew <laughs> and its history. But how fucking cool is that? That it, I mean, I, I like the last one the most, for sure. That it is a, it is a, it, that, that they are, Alphagrams, alphabetically ordered anagrams. So they are jumbles <clears throat> of the original word, but written with the jumbled letters in alphabetical fucking order. That's crazy. Right? Wow. I would have never imagined that that, <laughs> that that was something that people do. I mean, uh, the the... The number of you know different ways you can you can cipher something I guess is basically endless, but still that's that's a that's a pretty clever one, right? I love it, man. I really, really, really do, and uh, which is kind of all the pertinent information I can give you about this book. It's hmm. still at Yale. Uh, we still don't know who wrote it. We still don't know what it says. We still don't know if it's possibly from aliens or uh, maybe a crazy person that was on a bunch of drugs. Well, that was going to be my speculation was that it was it's uh, like some other planets. Uh, you know, a book that maybe they abducted a human, took him around, let him hang out for a bit. And this is what came of it once they dropped him back off. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could see that. It's just a jumble of things that are or are not to make things that are for sure are not. Right, right. Well, see, there you go. Mm -hmm. There you mm -hmm. go. And maybe on that planet, they had squatty women with uh, mm -hmm. wolf pussy. Yeah, and, and, uh, and cats chased dogs and people wore hats on their feet. And uh, they, and they spoke in alphabetically ordered anagrams. Indeed, that, see, yeah, that's so clever, so clever. It is very clever, and I want to, I want to actually try it out, but <clears> I, <throat> I just have a feeling that I'm going to lose interest way too fast. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound tedious. This, oh, this book was no short task. Mm. Well, you know what? We impressive just gave people a very uh, mysterious something to think about and possibly, hey guys, solve it and then give us the credit episode of See No, Hear No, Speak No. That's right. 
all of that and the box of Cracker Jacks to go along with your de- little, 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 mm. dosage of the UFOs, the conspiracies, and the murders. Indeed. You filthy sons of bitches. I think you mean the F-O-U's. Sure. Let's go with that. It's an alphabetically ordered anagram. That's right. (laughs) The F-O-U's. Nice. Very nice. Count down. Three. Three, two, and a one. Bye, kids. Hope you liked it. Do 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 do. Bye. Bye.